Hey everybody, it's GM Max here with another training video, and this one is all about the Alican defense against E4. If you're a more tactical player who likes to counterattack and go their own way a little bit in the opening, then I think that this opening is one that you'll be quite drawn to, to say the least. Now, the idea of the Alican is that after knight D5, D4, and D6, then we're putting some early pressure on the opponent's center. And yes, our knight does get kicked around in the process. We do lose a little bit of time. But the arising position is quite natural for us to play. In a lot of lines, you will see black go for this nice kingside fianchetto for almost Grunfeld style counterplay against DR, the white center. Also, before I do share a bit more about the Alican defense, also do make sure to like the video and consider subscribing. I also am accepting some private students, so feel free to reach out to me via Gmail or via Facebook using the link below in the description if that's something that's of interest to you while are watching this video. Anyway, let's uh, go a little bit further into this position. There are, of course, a couple of other old terms they could play along the way, but this is what you will face the most often uh, based on the League Chess database, which I'm using for players' games rated above 2,000 on League Chess, which then comes about 1,600, 1,700 over the board. Um, so if they do take on d6, I'm going to recommend taking back with the c-pawn in general and just going for this kingside fianchetto sub, which will give us some nice counterplay against the white center. Also notice, by the way, that in a position like this, we can see that you know, white space advantage is a little bit reduced in uh, in this case due to uh, yeah the five-pawn array being traded. If they do play the four pawns attack with f4, which I think you're not going to face quite as often as ed6, but is one of the more critical lines. Uh, there are a few approaches. I did consider also suggesting an approach with g6 here, but ultimately I decided to go for d takes e5 and this development with knight c6, bishop e3, bishop f5. And one of the main ideas we'll see here is that basically... When they play to move knight to f3, we're going to pin their knight with bishop to g4 and put some early pressure against the knight on f3 in this way. I'm going through the openings here a little bit briefly because we're actually going to do things a little differently in terms of style. Where rather than going deep into opening theory, what I'll do is I'll show you a lot of grandmaster games from these different key positions of the Alican so that you can play it at a high level yourself in your own games following the ideas that have been played before by strong players. Now at a master level, the most common move here is to move knight to f3, uh, not rushing to attack the knight, but keeping a little more flexibility. And when I was checking the Lee Chess Explorer to see what the best scoring line is for black, it was interesting to see that the best scoring line is not the old main line of bishop g4, or the modern main line of d takes e5, or the Albert variation of g6, but actually the best scoring line for black is this somewhat unusual move of knight to b6. It's also easy to remember if we just play knight b6 anyway, kind of anticipating the move c4 in advance. And I noticed that white was, yeah, not scoring that well against us on lead chess. Black already has a 50.5% score in the, the database. And the most common move here of e takes d6 in lead chess is one that we're reasonably happy to see, you know, we get the same sort of position as we saw before in the exchange variation. And if they do play a developing move, you know, we can just go g6 and just again get this relatively easy pressure against e5 pawn. So it's a pretty easy system to play in that sense. Now, usual disclaimer, like if you are playing against Grandmaster Opposition at slower time controls, then, you know, the Alican does allow white to obtain advantage with best play. So some of these lines aren't necessarily going to hold up at like the super GM level or say 2600 plus. But below that and certainly at faster time controls are systems that can work quite well, especially once you've gone through the ideas that I will be showing you in this video. Uh, if we do go back a little bit, I'll also point out that especially at lower levels, you're going to face a move like knight c3 quite a lot. And if you already have experience playing e4, e5 as black, I think that the best option is just to play e5 and basically transpose into e4, e5 where you know they don't have the Royal Lopez or the Italian or the Scotch available anymore. Well, at least not the pure Scotch. 
But if you don't have experience of e4, e5, you can still play the move d5, which is still going to give you a decent position. You know, if takes, you can play knight takes d5 and you get this decent Scandinavian alley can hybrid. And if they go e5, you can play the move d4 as an independent approach to the position, which probably objectively isn't as good as knight fd7, but knight fd7 is often going to transpose back into a Steinitz French, which is probably not going to be in the repertoires of most two. I mean, if you already played a French, then sure, you can play something like this and, you know, be happy with this as black. But if not, there's always d4 as a decent independent option that will only give white a very small advantage. With that being said, let's get into some of the games. And for these, I have a pretty large number, so we're going to go through them relatively quickly in each case, but just to give you some ideas of how the positions play out. And for this first game here between, uh, I'll say it applies up between Riazantsev as white against Demidov as black. I know that Demidov as a grandmaster often will play some quite creative ideas in the opening. Uh, this move of a4 is one you will see a lot at the master level. We're flicking in a4 and a5. It does have some advantages that the b5 square you know, becomes a little bit more weak, let's say, if you were to take back on, on d6 in this version is, is one point. Uh, which is one very reason why you may consider playing ed instead. But in the game, we had knight c3. And I'd recommend just playing the move g6, and just going for this setup once again, just applying all the pressure against the e5 pawn. Because in the game, after bishop g4, I think that h3 takes... That this was just giving white a very nice advantage here. He's got the bishop here. He's got more space. And you know, if white had played the move off e6 to not allow black to play e6 and kind of shut in the bishop, I do think this position is not really playable for black. So this is admittedly the reason why I probably yeah, wouldn't play the move bishop g4 personally. Um, it's interesting it still scores well in OK and Lee Chess, but yeah, G6 would would definitely be my recommendation here. On to the next game where we see the same starting moves for the first four, but this time White does play the move ED6. I think this game's a pretty good example of how to play if White goes for fairly routine development. We see White playing C4 in this position, and that does transpose back into the exchange variation with E takes D6. Uh, that we saw at the start of the video. So knight c3, Nakamura plays the move knight c6, which is actually a little bit imprecise, you know, allowing white to play d5 and kick away our knight is not exactly ideal here, which is why I think the better move order would be to play castles first, uh, castles, and I'd sort of wait with the move bishop knight c6 and I'd play bishop g4 first, because then when you play knight 6 you're going to have a lot more pressure against the d4 pawn, and we'll see later, you can also fix that pawn with c d5, which can be quite nice in the middle game. Like your plans in the space are either to play d5 and fix d4 in place, or to break free in the center with e5 are your two main ideas in the structure. Uh, but in a game, white didn't really exploit this, and the result was that black just gained a very comfortable position out of the opening. It is true, probably black should have played d5 immediately, there's quite a Important move to again fix that d4 pawn as a target. Um, you're not afraid of c5 because you do have knight c4 to you know, get the knight in and get some good play in that way. But in the game, I didn't really punish this. You know, again, he missed a chance to play d5, which is really the move you should be watching out for here as black. Because um, if you had to take a position like this, for example, the, the knight is just really horrible on a5 and b6. This is the kind of thing you really want to avoid. But white played a little too passively with b3, and you know after d5, black just gets everything that he wants. After c5, knight c8, the knight's ready to swing around to f5, which is indeed what happened in the game. You could say white didn't really play it in the most precise way by any means, and the result is that black is already quite significantly better, where knight f5 does put a lot of pressure against the d4 pawn. White tried to avoid it with g4, but then just e5, and you know, the center was just getting ripped open, with White's king not really having a safe refuge. And Nakamura did indeed go on to win. At this point, Black's already winning a pawn. And yeah, it's just really bad for White from, from this stage. So uh, there's only a few more moves. Let's quickly show you the remainder. Queen a6. So White's trying to cover knight d3. But yeah, Black is just 
throwing everything at this white king and yeah since bishop queen e2 is a a mate for right now uh this is why uh white white resigned here because white basically just lost a piece yeah to be fair white's already kind of losing anyway because of the weakness of his king in the long term but turns out that Dubrov and Nakamura actually had another game with this in a uh, speed chess challenge where this time Nakamura used a slightly different move order playing the immediate knight b6 and only then d6 which yeah doesn't really change too much as such so knight f3 d6 and yeah, again this game also took a fairly similar trend where you know again white should really go d5 and try to punish black for his inaccurate move order but instead white played a little bit too passively and when they play passively in the alley kind of just gives you a a great opportunity to get very nice play you know, again this pawn being a target on d4 being a bit of a theme in the middle game and yeah even without the ideal bishop g4 knight c8 sub like still doing pretty much fine here where in this case the plan is going to be more to either play a move like e5 and just try to break through in the center with a, a position like this here you do get pretty decent piece play where you can push the pawn you can get your bishop active and so forth um but yeah the active piece play definitely makes up for the iqp in this instance in the game nakamura played knight f6 and you know the rest of the game maybe isn't the most instructive possible but still the idea of playing like b6 and then getting rid of this bad bishop was one that the car used to good effect in this game even though the computer admittedly doesn't really agree with this and yeah just wants to like sort of play more in the center instead but yeah that's just showing a little bit of how this middle game can play out again with the backward d4 pawn being a bit of a factor in these lines that basically offsets your space disadvantage uh it turns out nakamura also had played this knight b6 system against the pomnishi actually in a game where they're both you know, a lot younger than than nowadays i think this might have been from a talmorial blitz if i remember correctly but yeah, this time Hikaru does just play the g6 system, and yeah, it doesn't play the move on knight c6 too early. Um, actually, at this point, this wouldn't be a bad moment to play d take c5. Because white would like to play knight e5, but f6 forks are a bit of a problem. And if you get a position like this one, say take, take, like the end games are just generally going to be very nice for black here. You know, we stop them annoying us with knight b5, and you know, we just position our pieces just to put that e5 pawn under a lot of pressure um you know this pawn definitely is a long-term weakness in the end game for white after bishop g7 queen d2 this is how the game played out h6 knight c6 all very thematic and it turns out they're already black is the one fighting for an advantage here because of this bishop being not so great on g5 castles black played bishop to g4 just increasing all the pressure on e5 and it's also the other reason i recommend this approach not just that it scores well for black but it's also very thematic i think once hikaru plays like d5 i think the game loses some of its relevance because i think this is not really in keeping with the whole plan of pressuring the e5 pawn the pin is a little bit annoying so i think i would probably just play a6 and just break the pin yeah your pawns get doubled but you do have the b file for counterplay and you are going to have the bishop pair advantage so i do think that black is probably the one fighting for an advantage um you know for okay g1 we even have moves like bishop e6 we just don't really let white kind of get past our formation in a sense uh so that's the way i would play it but let's see some other games as well from from this point uh in the alican um those are all the games by the way with the knight c3 knight b6 system and so there's some others that have been played as well but again just sort of picking out the most high level most significant games and we can sort of see that nakamura is basically the hero for black and we definitely recommend do check out some of his games in your own time if you want to really master these positions but for this next game between john van der Veel against Vaganyan, in this game we're going to see what to do if they play the four pawns attack and you may already recall yet yeah, we're going to exchange and basically put pressure on their center uh note by the way that knight f3 does allow us to play bishop g4 and basically get the same position as before but where we gain a, a full tempo by comparison which really does help us quite a lot so white should therefore delay the move of knight f3 waiting for us to develop our bishop first and then play knight f3 um, and by the way the old main line here is to go bishop e7 and castles and f6 and 
you can play this, but I'm decided not to recommend it because first of all, I think that this variation is just going to be much better for white. I do think white has a, a clear advantage in a position like this with the extra space and the isolated pawn on e6. And you also have to remember a whole lot of theory after d5 just to get a reasonable position. So it just doesn't really feel as practical as going for the shortcut with bishop g4, which, by the way, does have a 52% win rate for black on lead chess, like a pretty big plus score. So that's also something going in its favor. Now, after bishop e2, uh, black played move bishop takes f3. Um, of course, bishop takes f3 would run into the move knight takes c4 here. So for this reason, white plays g takes f3. And the move queen d7 is sort of an interesting alternative that black played, but I think objectively it's probably not very good. Uh, you know, in the game, white played f4, which is not so great. And you know, with this very tricky move here of bishop b4 and you know, after dc6, queen c6, you know, having the attack on the queen, the rook, black was able to use these tactics to kind of stay afloat and get a reasonable position in the game. But the reason I don't recommend this is I think if white just plays queen to d3 or queen d2 and just castles, I think that you know, white just has the bishop pair and the space and that this isn't really playable for black. So for this reason, I would recommend black instead plays queen h4, which I believe does come up in the in the next game. So let's uh, let's take a look at it. So we're going to go through the starting moves again just to help you to ingrain it into your memory as such. So knight b6, we take... Knight c6, bishop f5, e6, bishop g4. Okay, in this game, White actually does something a little bit different, where Hubner plays the move of queen to d2 instead. Not a bad move either in this position, but I think that Hort's reply bishop b4 is a fairly nice one, with the idea of being after a3. And bishop e7, that yeah, we have created a slight weakening in White's position, where... If they do play a move like Castles Long, they're now going to run into Knight A5. And this only works because with A3 being played, we're threatening Knight B3 fork, as well as the attack on C4. So for this reason, White plays Knight E4 instead, kind of preparing Long Castles by depriving Knight A5. But that's fine. Black played Queen D7, Bishop E2. And this position is actually quite fine for Black here, where uh, I really like the move that Hort played here of Bishop F5 just putting some tension against a knight on e4, uh, which is a little bit awkward for white to defend. Knight g3, bishop g6, and, you know, the bishop just has a really nice diagonal, and white probably should already be thinking about trying to exchange off this bishop, because in the game after h4, black found a really brilliant move in this position. Now, you might be thinking, well, let's just play h5 or h6, so that our bishop has a hidey hole, you know, on h7, as it were. And that's definitely a playable approach, but the move that Hort found was this really great knight to b4 move. And the idea of knight b4 is you're basically threatening knight a2 mace, and they can't really take your knight either, because then you go queen a4, and you're threatening checkmate with queen a1. And if they try to block it in some way, like say they go bishop to d3, for instance, you have this really nice shot with knight take c4, where, again, they can't take the knight because then queen a1 is checkmate. But if they try to block it, well, it's it's hard to find a way to block it. Like, if they move the queen this way, we can take their bishop. And if they try to defend their bishop, then, yeah, you have queen a1 and you basically just give checkmate, as, as you can see here. So white's already in a bit of a pickle. And after b3 to cover knight a2, you know, knight c2, and, you know, the knight is just deep in white's territory and wreaking all kinds of havoc, and from this point, Black did go on to win the, the game as such. So, very nice example, showing some nice tactical vision, and yeah, a lot of these tactics do come up in the alley, and this is a very dynamic opening. Let's look at a few more games. So let's look at Fedorov against Baburin. Baburin, yeah, being one of the very old-school uh, alley can players. So, we have the other sequence. I will add, by the way, you can also consider using a bishop f5 move order, where this move order does potentially give you some some extra options that you can explore. Um, but yeah, that's maybe a bit of a, a different topic, let's say. Anyway, the game saw knight c3, 6, bishop b3, bishop f5, all pretty standard stuff we've seen before, and you know, this game is pretty similar. 
In terms of the opening to what we saw before, like all these moves are the same as the Hub Not Hot game we saw just then. Um, but this time, White decided to play the move of B4, which, as we'll see, is probably not the best move here, where after Bishop F3 and GF3, we can see a very common theme for the Alican, that Black is a little bit overextended in this position. And Black took advantage of by playing Castles, White defended with Rook D1, um, funny enough, the engine actually doesn't hate long castles, but from a human point of view, you are definitely leaving your king looking a little bit open here. And you do have a very nice trick as well, where this move of knight takes e5 actually ends up being quite good. Because um, if they take, you have like queen a4, and you end up having some pretty nasty frets against their king to more than make up for the, the piece, as it were. So again, you see a lot of trap tactics coming up in this opening. After rook d1, you know, this does avoid the knight e5 trick, but now bishop h4 is quite disruptive. Now after knight g3 and f6, we can sort of see again that white center is being ripped apart a little bit. After b5, knight e7, you know, it's a very tense position, but one where I think it's easier to play black because of the exposed position of white's king. And as the game played out, you know, black just kind of outplayed white from here, like knight f5, bishop f2. Uh, queen f7 kind of a nice move, just keeping the tension and, you know, realizing if white does play knight f5 that, you know, you're just going to exchange off the pieces and, you know, say that white's king is just quite exposed in the, as the minor pieces get traded off. White played f4 in the game, but then g5 was a really great way to, again, just force open the lines to get the white king. And as the game played out, we could kind of see yeah, that white just doesn't really have a, a playable position at this point. Um, yeah, their center might look impressive, but after g4, like, our queen is just coming into the attack, and there's not a whole lot I can really do about it. Um, the game went on for quite a few more moves, like, I'm not going to play for every single move from here, but you can sort of see, like, how you would typically outplay an opponent in these positions, and it only really takes, like, one mistake or two mistakes of white for his position to end up very overextended in quite a, a difficult state here. Um, finally, the Timon... Uh, picket game, which I think is the last one I have here for the the four pawns attack. Um, also, I will point out they can play the move of f4 as well, but it's not going to change too much. Um, you could even argue kind of get a better version of the of the four pawns attack when you haven't had to you know, move the knight to b6. But because like c4 knight b4, like this is sort of explaining the the difference a little bit. But yeah, in the game, white does use the correct move order. And after take, take, knight c6, bishop e3, bishop f5. We've seen all this before, like, this just to help you, like, consolidate it. And in this game, we do see kind of the main line of take, take, and queen to h4. And in this line, you're going to basically often get a, well, black blade move queen h3, which is actually a little bit of a tricky move here. Uh, the more common move, though, is to move queen to f4, and, you know, in this case... Well, I kind of need to know this move of c5 to get an advantage, which is definitely not the most natural when you're giving the d5 outpost. Um, and if they do play it, yeah, you can play like knight d5 or knight d7. And, you know, white's definitely quite a bit better here. But, you know, in lower lead chess, black seems to score reasonably well. So you can say you get decent practical chances for a worst case scenario. Um, and if they don't find this, yeah, you're sort of getting a pretty decent position, like, for example, queen d2 is already a bit of a mistake. I can sort of see how the the white center really falls apart if white makes just one mistake in these uh, in these lines. So queen f4 is probably the move I would recommend, but in the game, black played queen h3, and okay, here white did find the move of c5, which is the key move to, to have a very good position. And yeah, I think in this position, white was just quite a bit better. You know, the move f4 is... Not the absolute best one, but, you know, it does stop long castles and does give white a nice edge. Again, maybe bishop e7 is the move I'd play to, to try to make this work as black. You know, trying to get in some, you know, bishop h4 and kind of play for, like, the knight against the bishop kind of position. But, yeah, in the game after queen f5 castles, to be fair, white probably should have won this game because white does have a very dominant position here and, you know, a move like queen to h3 and... Bishop e3, I think, is just going to be very unpleasant for black. But, yeah, instead white played bishop e3, and, you know, as the game played out, the weakness of white's king started to become a factor. 
Right, the Grook F4, Queen G6. Like, already, Black has sort of fought his way back to having a pretty fine position. And he ended up winning just by, yeah, sort of taking control of the center and just exploiting the weak white king in the long term. So, yeah, as you can sort of see with the Alicin, like, it is something we should be quite honest about. Like, it's not going to equalize and, you know, whatever you play against the four pawns attack or four knife three, like, you are going to be a bit worse out of the opening. But you do get a quite interesting position with good attacking chances and, you know, White does have to play quite precisely to sort of prove his advantage. And given that very few people are going to really be prepared for the Alicin, it's sort of a decent gamble that your opponents are not really going to be as prepared for it as, say, a professional player would be. In any case, let's now move to the systems with the, the exchange variation. And yeah, let's start with this game between Soshko against Ross and Talis. You know, Rosatars being one of the old school Lithuanian grandmasters. And again, we can see in the exchange variation, we're just going for this kingside Fianchetto once again. And here, Soshko does play the main line of the Voronezh system with rook c1, castles, and b3. And the idea of this system is basically like that you can now meet the move knight c6, which is what was played in the game with d5. And now you're not losing the, the knight to bishop takes c3. And you're not really concerned about knight e5 or knight a5 because the pawn's already defended. So this game's kind of an example of what black should avoid, where in the game I played a bit inaccurately with a3 and you know, black was sort of able to get you know, a decent counterplay of e6 and have a have a reasonable position in the end. But if white had played bishop e2 and then gone f4, then you know, white would just have a very big advantage you know, position like uh, like this one, let's say, with you know, f4, knight e7, you know, knight f3. Like, white just has a very comfortable space advantage. It's not really a, a fully playable position for black. Which is why in this position, I wouldn't recommend playing knight c6. I'd recommend either playing the move of e5 and sort of going into this old main line. Or if you want to be a bit more flexible, you can play the waiting move of bishop f5. Which has been my personal preference, where you keep the options open both of playing e5 or playing the move d5, depending on what their reply is. And Black does score like 50% in the lead chess database. So it's definitely a, you know, you're definitely getting chances here, let's say. But yeah, this game's being more of an example probably what not to do as Black. So let's now see the game between Nakamura against Shabalov. Where this one, so we see see Nakamura facing the, uh, the uh, Alicant for a change. But yeah, in this case, White goes for a bit of a creative approach. Like rather than playing the usual Knight C3 and... This sort of thing we saw before, or you know, a more normal looking stuff like knight f3 and bishop e2, which you might face quite a bit in your in your own games, let's say. Um, rather than this, you know, white just played the move d5 directly, trying to sort of disrupt black setup. But the arising position ended up being quite fine for black. But something to kind of keep in mind here is that you're actually fairly happy with the exchange of the dark squared bishops because. Once you play e5, as Shabalov did here, like, now your bishop isn't stuck behind the pawn anymore. And this flank attack that, you know, Nakamura went for just doesn't really have as much sting when you've sort of got the space around the king side to deal with it. And, I mean, it's true, probably, like, didn't play it in the absolute best way. Like, for example, here, you know, the move of uh, knight a4 is a bit of a weird suggestion from the computer. Um... I guess a move like a5 and playing from the dark swords might be a bit more conventional, but in any case, it's still the position that arose was still quite fine for black. I mean, again, you're reasonably happy to play an end game where you've got like this, you know, very flexible pawn majority and, you know, where it's not so easy for white to kind of move his own pawns, let's say. Because white's dream pawn breaks definitely go c5 and get a pass d pawn, but the knight being on a6 makes that a little bit difficult. Well, ended up retreating Queen, but I think Black was just doing quite fine here. And yeah, in the end, Shabalov did go on to win a pretty nice game where you could say Hikaru probably was a little bit too ambitious. Like, Queen F5 already looks kind of unnatural, and, you know, in the game, Black was able to kind of get his majority moving, like E4 and Knight E5. And, and yeah, Black's piece just coordinated very well here. Like, once the Knight gets to the D3, it's going to be practically very unpleasant for White, and... You know, later in the game, Black went Bishop D7 and you know, got an attack going with B5. And yeah, B5 maybe objectively isn't the very best, but like practically it's quite tough to defend when your king is being ripped open like this. And yeah, in the end, 
Shabal got rewarded for his aggressive play with a with a very nice win. Um, maybe I can just quickly play for the final moves. Like there's not that many left to go through, but yeah, against obviously like you know White's trying to trying to sort of defend himself, but you know Black does have some initiative to work with. Who does have the connected pass pawns? Um, well, this is merely a bit of a nice trick to go d2 and d1 equals queen. Yeah, rook f1, rook c4, and you can see white made some like small but actually quite significant mistakes where yeah white is now just like running out of, of things to do and yeah white just resigned because the knight is going to be lost at the end of all the exchanges and you know you can't move the knight either here because yeah bishop f5 and and it will be a, a back rank knight so very nice game by shabalo for sure i also have another game by daniel dubov where we see once again, White going for this weird early d5, and once more, this e5 ends up being a pretty good response. And really, this position arise here is probably a little bit more like a knight off than a um, than an Alucan in spirit. But certainly, the arising position is quite nice for Black. Um, knight d7 is also a very nice idea that if they take, you can sort of take, and like your lead in development is going to be more important than the uh, than the fact that you're down a pawn. Um, if bishop e2, you can sort of take and you know, play queen h4 and you know, white has a really hard time once they lose the right to castle in a, in a position as open as this. Um, so a very fun game. You know, we also have like bishop h4 ideas that we see with, yeah, when this king is having to walk, it's just not really very good. And, and black did go on to win this fairly convincingly from here. So this game was pretty one-sided. So let's move on to the game between Aroni and against Carlson. Which sees the sort of stuff that you might see a fair bit in, in your own games at lower levels, like below 2000. So this one again features exchange, you know, variation, pretty standard stuff, bishop b3. This time Aronian goes for a slightly different setup with h3 and playing the move knight to f3. So basically trying to avoid the bishop g4 pin that we saw in the Dubrov game. The trade-off for this, however, in... By the way, this point also applies if you were to play knight f3 and cast and some bishop e2. It would be the same move of knight c6 for black here as well for similar reasons. But basically knight c6 is a bit more effective in this version. And the reason it's more effective is that if they play d5, which is what white played in the game, because you know, if you play rook c1, black will just go e5. And you know, just get this very nice position like if d5, knight e7. Well, you've got... <laughs> Excuse me. We got moves like f5 available. We can start to push your kingside majority forward in a very aggressive way. Um, and even a move like d5, like we've seen before, is also pretty decent here. In fact, so even kind of a choice of different plans to give you a reasonable game depending on your your taste. Uh, I guess I should also mention I can also play d5, but yeah, after d5 you have a central majority. I could get a good square for the knight in d4. And it's going to pretty much give you a fine position here as black. So in the game, I played d5 immediately, but that ran into some other problems with knight a5 and you know, this pawn. On c4, is suddenly not so easy to defend effectively. Uh, like if you play knight d2, then black can play bishop f5 and just pile the pressure on the pawn. No, by the way, white doesn't have time for b4 because then the c3 knight would be left undefended. So the knight being on the edge is not that big of a deal here. In the game, I played bishop to d4, which is a very nice move, realizing that, you know, we can't just win a pawn with knight takes c4, because why is going to exchange everything and win the material back with queen to d4? Um, you know, we do have knight e5, but it's not really an ideal turn of events, let's say. So instead, Carlson just plays bishop d4, and, you know, like we've seen before, when we trade off the bishops, we revert back to the e5 plan. And this pressure against the c4 pawn now development kind of makes up for the uh, makes up for the isolated d6 pawn as such. If they play b3, we're just ready to go d5 and just open up the center that way. And also kick their queen with knight c6, I might add. In the game after knight e4, black found a very nice defense, this you know, knight f6 windmill attempt in the move of knight c6. And yeah, it just turns out that. You know, queen c3 runs into knight a4, so white's not really able to, you know, keep his knight defended on the long diagonal. But after queen f4, bishop f5, black's just doing very well here. We can see the opening of the center really favors black in a hypermodern opening like the Alican. 
After bishop d3, you know, the white king was left stuck in the center. And after d5, Carlsen did go on to win a very nice game, just exploring the white king in the middle. Um, so yeah, very nice example of showing what it is that black is trying to do in the alley can just trying to open up the center and, you know, take advantage of our good development in a sense. And really punish white when they fail the castle quickly enough. Now, to conclude, I will just share a few more games from the sideline of knight c3. It's something that, yeah, you're not going to face that often at higher levels, but I think that a lot of you watching this will face the move knight c3 a fair bit. So I do want to just briefly touch on a few ideas you can use from here. This game was played between Harakrishna against Ivanchuk, and here there are a lot of quite playable moves for black in this situation, but I kind of like the Grunfeld style approach with g6, which I think fits quite well with our repertoire in general. Um, like if they play a move like d4, you, know, you just get this very typical Grunfeld pressure. Like I've had a sequence like this in quite a few of my games where you just pile, pile the pressure on the d4. And it's really not so easy for White to find a good way to deal with this, quite frankly, uh, especially with his pawns being, you know, doubled here. In the game, White played a little bit more solidly with g3, but it's also not the most critical. Like, in the game, Black played knight b6 and ended up winning a rather long battle, but I think that in a game, I would probably just go again for the Grunfeld-style approach, like c5, play like knight c6, and I think that Black probably just has the better side of equality. Where, you know, the trade-off for not playing d4 is that white also lacks a bit of space to kind of maneuver his pieces in such a structure. Anyway, I'm going to move on a bit to the next game, where we see the same first three moves, but this time with white playing bishop to c4. And Kiri decided to just play it on a very Scandinavian sort of style, playing c6, bishop g4, and just going for this kind of setup. Which you can sort of play without really needing to know any theory, which is quite nice. Uh, and you know, White in turn tried to play a little bit creatively and not just put the pawn on d4. But the arising position is just fine for Black. Like, White didn't really get that much out of this knight maneuver to g3. Um, Bishop b4 is a little bit of a tricky move here, where if White does play the obvious c3, well, then you can play, like, Bishop takes and, you know, even some, some tricks available, like knight c3, and, you know, they can't take back because then you do have the, the fork as such. So there are little tricks like this in the position, and after King F1, like Black just has a very good version of a Karakhan or Scandinavian, where you know Black can just castle short, just steadily improve the position, like grab space on the queen side, and Black just yeah end up winning a pretty nice game quite convincingly. So not too much more to, to see there in a sense. Also, a game between one of the big experts of the uh, of the Alican, where Suleiman Lingus White was playing against the. Alcan export Bortnik as black. Amber actually recently did a, a chess book course on this opening. And yeah, in this one after bishop c4, this time instead of Kiri c6, he played knight b6. And and this is, I guess, like the more like old-fashioned sub where you just play like e6 and bishop e7 castles. And and if they play d4, you just sort of put a lot of pressure on the uh, on the pawn that way. And also in some lines, you can also play moves like knight e5, uh, knight a5. Uh, like, for example, you can play knight a5 here and just, you know, get rid of their bishop pair and get that bishop versus knight in balance to give yourself decent chances to win the game and outplay the opponent as such. In the actual game, I played a little bit weirdly with knight h4 and, you know, like, I think was basically just doing fine here where, yeah, the bishop being stuck on d7 is admittedly not ideal in this case. It is probably true, yeah, that black would have maybe, you know, not played bishop d7 and you know, perhaps just played bishop g6 and you know, recycling the bishop might have been a better approach here. But anyway, it's good to know how to deal these sort of moves in any case. And finally, the game between Smyslov and Beganyan. This one's a bit of a weird one in that you know, white played knight d5, which is not a very good move, but it's one that you might see a fair bit at lower levels of play, where you know, often you can just go for a sub like bishop g4 and long castles and you know, just put loads and loads of pressure on d4. It is something that can really cause a lot of headaches for your opponents, actually. Smyslov instead played this sort of quiet queen f3 move, and if I was playing black, I'd probably just go bishop e6 and just take back with the bishop. And that way you sort of get this nice pressure down the long diagonal and, you know, chance to perhaps get the space advantage quite early with a quick e5 break. But instead, black played e6 and, you know, end up that the position was 
it was fairly symmetrical, but you know, White just played a little bit too passively and you know, Black was sort of able to in a very long battle basically outplay his opponent. We can sort of see like how you know, there are some small problems like Bishop G2 is a move that White wants to play and it was the move that he did play. But then the rook kind of gets in and yeah, it's just slightly unpleasant for White. And Black was kind of able to leverage that yet to ultimately, you know, win the game in a in a very nice fashion. Looking at a, a few more games just to round things up, like we do want to... Okay, the move order is a little bit different with knight c3 and then e4, but yeah, basically this would be how our normal alley can move order, let's say. And like I said at the start, knight fd7 is quite a good choice if you play the excited French as black. But if not, then you're probably going to want to go for the move d4 instead. Where if they play knight c2, I think that instead of Wesley So's knight fd7, I would probably... Just play the move of knight g4 instead, and you know, then you get this weird kind of position, like after say knight c6, where you know, if they play knight f3, you can sort of play moves like d3 or even h5, and it's a weird structure, but one where I don't think black is, is going to be worse by any means. Interestingly enough, the idea is not so much to take, but actually just to like maneuver the pieces around and yeah, basically say that white has some structural problems in a sense and that the d4 square becomes a bit of a hole, but okay, a bit of a weird position, admittedly. Uh, but also, if they play knight g3, you have some fun ideas like g5, we can sort of weaken the white structure, and yeah, once again, very, very chaotic position arising. Uh, but more often than not, you are going to face the move ef6 here, and yeah, that's what we're going to see in the in the next couple of games. Yeah, and this one here between Ponkratov against... He's Matulin, we can already see yeah, Black playing knight g4, and okay, in this game he played c5 instead of knight c6, which is maybe not absolutely the most precise, but yeah, probably not going to make the biggest difference in, in your games, let's say. Uh, but let's get to the, the f6 sign, because this one is kind of the the critical test, if you like. So after dc3, f takes g7, c takes d2, bit of a funny sequence. Uh, Mike's best bet here might actually be to play queen takes d2 and you know just play out this end game where yeah white's well, probably a tiny bit better in this end game because we have one more pawn island than uh, that white does but we do also have a central majority so that does give some imbalance and at this point I think a decent plan is probably just go like knight c6 bishop e6 long castles rook g8 and that's going to give you some pretty decent active play. If they do play bishop b5, you might put the bishop on d7 instead, just so you're not having to worry about the double pawns in that sense. But yeah, definitely a fighting position where, you know, the better player is going to win, essentially. In the game, white played a move bishop d2. And I think that the move c3 playing the game is a little bit passive, where it is the most common move in lead chess. But I'd probably prefer to play a move like queen h5 as white, which sort of defends the, the b2 pawn indirectly. And does prepare long castling. You know, you can play queen d4 as, as one way to deal with it and, you know, get some some small disruption to white up, let's say. Uh, but definitely get some pretty nice active piece play. Uh, they also could play queen f3. It was also a move they can go for. But it does involve a pawn sack, so I'm not sure how willing your average opponent is going to be to, to go into this. But something that advanced players yeah, are going to want to make sure they know what they're doing here. But after c3, yeah, black is, I think, just going to be pretty comfortable in general. Um, move queen d5 is kind of an interesting alternative to the move knight c6 in the game. This one, you're still trying to disrupt white's development a little bit. But knight c6 is pretty normal as well. Like knight f3, bishop g4. Um, and it's true, there are some small tactical issues, like queen a4 might set some problems for black. but Which is a reason, again, why you might prefer to play queen d5 first or... You know, play bishop e6 and just cast along in that way. Because uh, bishop e6 also does kind of discourage short long castling by white in a sense. And if they do castle short, you know, you are going to get some... Uh, you are going to get some good counterplay down the down the g-file to work with as such. Um, but yeah, in the game, white didn't really punish black for his inaccurate move order. And the result is that black has got this pretty typical position where you, like, you cast along... You know, bishop e3 is probably not the most precise, but, you know, not so bad either. And, yeah, just a position we always had a bit of a fight on our hands where, you know, probably white should just, you know, simplify down and, you know, accept that it's going to be only a, a tiniest of edges for white. Instead, rook d5 is probably just a bit too fancy and, you know, in the arising position. 
Yeah, black was able to have a pretty good play where you know white has a bit of a weak king and this isolated e3 pawn, which sort of gives black some room to, to kind of work with here. And while white is probably a bit better at this point, you know, in the end, black did manage to to sort of win the, the game from this stage, just sort of outplaying his opponent. Uh, now I think it would probably rook d8 is not most precise. You probably want to go queen h4 and you know make him lose the right to castle, and, and that's going to be a lot more effective by comparison. Uh, but yeah, those were the games I want to share with in the Alican. You can sort of see that the Alican does lead to some very interesting positions. It's quite a exciting opening. You're well suited for tactical, counter-attacking, and somewhat creative players. And this general plan is putting the knight on b6 and going g6, bishop, g7, castles. It's something you can do against almost everything that white does, actually. So it's a very systematic approach in that respect. And we've also seen how white has to play quite precisely to keep an advantage. It only takes like one or two mistakes and to lose control of the center and for black to get very, very nice piece play. So that being said, yeah, I wish you luck with playing the Alicant in your games. As I mentioned it early in the, in the video, yeah, if you enjoyed this coaching style and you are interested in learning from me on a private level, then yeah, feel free to reach out to me uh, using the links in the description. Um, and yeah, comment below as well, yeah, what was your main insights or biggest takeaways that you got from uh, today's video. That's all for me for now, for now, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.